Hello, hello, and welcome once again to an episode of Campus Debates. As always, I am your host, Abigail Wairimo, and welcome yet again to another informative, powerful conversation that revolves around discourse, current affairs, trending topics, and anything that might impact you as a citizen or as an individual in society. Here at Campus Debate, we strive to give you a purely intellectual conversation, and we do this through the point of view of university students, who always give us, time and time again, a fresh perspective and an informed idea. With that said, help me in welcoming today's team. From side proposition, I have two lovely ladies, Angel Musomba and Imani Naitore. Oh, come on guys, share them all the way across the floor. And on side opposition, I have with me Sandra Njoki and Brian Kitui. Uh-oh, -uh. come on, come on. You know the rules? No sitting, What's no sitting rules? before. Our audience at least gets to understand who you are before you start busting out grammatical confetti and scaring people at home. Anyway, let me start on this side. Between the two of you, who would you say is more interesting? Mm. I believe as a team you know each other well enough, yeah? Because one thing debate teams are formed on is a basis of chemistry, yeah? So, who do you think is more interesting? You can rock, paper, scissors if you want. Okay, let's rock, paper, scissors. <laughs> <laughs> rock, paper, scissors. Okay. <laughs> sure. Who wins? Wait, rock, rock, paper, scissors. Not rock, Fine. paper, scissors. Shoot. Same. Okay. Rock, paper, scissors. Okay. <laughs> sure. You win. <laughs> Tell us, what is the most interesting thing about you? Um, the most interesting thing about me. It's a really difficult question. Mm. Um, when. When I was a child, I had pneumonia. I also had bronchitis at the same time. And then I lived. Oh. Okay. <laughs> I don't know what to say to that, so. I think we probably should have had Angel, yeah? <laughs> we probably should have had. That was a bit dark, but okay. We're glad you lived, you're here. You guys, what is, okay, what is, really up here and then the other one is like really down here like i said debate teams are formed on a basis of chemistry because you know you need to be able to think alike speak alike and most importantly correlate your arguments in a way that after you speak it feels like a synthetic flow before the house so what would you say for you guys is the basis of your chemistry because it is definitely not your height well Probably the fact that we are the best of both worlds. Okay, okay. Yeah. What worlds would those be? Oh, the really tall and the really short. <laughs> <laughs> I like it, I like it. Anyway, those are our participants. You can have a seat now. I think the rest, we would want to hear you speak before we judge you. All right, and as always, I'm joined with a panel of three brilliant debaters who are also judges who will be giving us the verdict and the analysis for this round. Help me in welcoming the chair for this specific round, Ms. Farisa Machemba. <laughs> Next to her, we have the very able and the very capable Jane Varaza. Welcome, Jane. And lastly, the only gentleman of the panel, help me in welcoming Luis Gitu. Uh, I was worried I was going to butcher his name, but I got it, I got it. Anyway, so among the very prevailing things that we've seen happening in our country today was the African Climate Summit, which was held right here in Kenya in KICC, which attracted a cohort of delegates from African continent to the far west to beyond. There was a lot of things that were said about the African Conference. Uh, things doing from the planning to the execution, but one prevailing dominant factor that people, especially on Twitter, were quite quick to to criticize was the Nairobi Declaration. They asked us the appen-ending question that has been asked any time a reform is made on the law. Sure, 
You can sit in KICC, you can wear the suits and you can have the conversation, but can you actually follow through with the promises, with the conversations, and give us a country, a world with reduced climate change, which is becoming an ever apparent issue in today's world? Looking basically just around at the kind of weather we've been experiencing in Nairobi, for example, in the morning it's 20 degrees, in the evening it's 30 something degrees. It really doesn't make sense. Climate change is a pressing issue and an issue that needs to be discussed. And with that said, today here in the House, the motion that the debaters will be debating will be, this House believes that the carbon trading that forms part of the Nairobi Declaration as stated in the African Climate Summit 2023 actually does more harm than good in the fight against climate change. With that said, speakers, you have your motion. First proposition, you have the floor. Here, here. Yeah. Okay, uh, the mic is audible. All right. Um, I'd like to begin my speech in, sorry, let me set up my timer as well. In three, two, one. Okay, so we're here to discuss the issue of carbon trading and what that will do in the fight against climate change. And so I'll begin with some definitions. So what is carbon trading? Carbon trading is a system where companies are given credits that determine how much carbon they can use. When, uh, sorry, how much carbon they can emit. When they reach their cap, they can trade with other companies or Yes, they can trade with other companies and then the money that is generated in this market exchange is supposed to go towards fighting the effects of climate change. On a global scale, this would also look like countries trading carbon tra credits with each other. So, moving on to the most, the central theme of this discussion, climate change. What is climate change and why are we fighting? So climate change is the rapid global increase in temperature brought about by human activities. And the reason we're fighting is essentially for survival. If we do not fight climate change, the Earth will gradually become uninhabitable, not only for us, but also for the other, other species that inhabit Earth. This will look like no food, no water. Already we have had the hottest August on record. I believe last year was the hottest year ever recorded, and these records go back to the 1800s. So we are, we are on a trajectory towards extinction. And who, will this, the, who this will impact most is the global south, third world countries, the poor, people like us at the end of the day. Even though we're middle class, we have some cushioning, everyone will feel the effects of global warming. And what good does carbon trading do? We do acknowledge that there is good in the system. By putting a cap on the cumulative emissions that companies can emit, we will lower the total emissions, and that will go some way in fighting climate change, but we believe it does not go far enough. Point one, carbon trading allows the biggest contributors to climate change to continue to get away with, pollu with polluting the earth and making it un uninhabitable for billions. So this is because they have the economic power to simply buy more credits. If you've reached your cap, all you have to do is buy more. Second, it does not require any changes to the broken system that we already have. And we know the system is broken because it's gotten us to this point where we have the hottest months on, on record, where the, sea, the very chemistry of the sea is changing. And furthermore, carbon is still being emitted under this system. That's important to remember. And the people who are suffering are the most vulnerable, the poor, women, who have to walk for miles and miles to get water. And this is an issue close to home because northern Kenya is facing one of the worst droughts it's ever faced. P millions are dying, and yet here we are, implementing a system that does not go far enough in securing our future. My second point, the carbon trading is a bit tokenistic, to put it mildly. It's moral vindication for the companies, for emitters. They can say, yes, we've paid for carbon credits, they're going to go do good somewhere, it's not our problem. And so they have that feeling that you can pat yourself on the back. They can say, we're carbon credits approved, or whatever it is. And yet, 
what this has done is it's not actually addressed the root of the issue, which is the extractive model of production that rests on fossil fuels. It was built on coal, it has continued to oil, and it will continue until the coal and the oil run out and the earth has become uninhabitable. At the end of the day, it's, it's about how much does a life cost? And can we afford to be complacent? Can we afford to pay for carbon credit when the earth is literally dying? Point number three. The other side will say that the money generated by this system will go to fighting climate change. But remember, the, most of the burden of pollution rests with the global north. There are the one, China, countries like China, the US, Europe, as a bloc, they produce the most carbon. And who's suffering? Tiny little islands like Vanuatu, Hawaii, seashells. People that do not cause the problem are the ones that are most desperate to address it. And this carbon credit system on a global scale will allow the global north to continue polluting while the global south cleans up their mess. And remember, this will need vast amounts of land to offset the carbon produced by a company like BP. How much land, how many trees must you plant to offset one million metric tons of carbon? We must think about who will be most impacted by the carbon offsetting programs that are a natural extension of carbon trading. Where will the land come from? Indigenous communities in the global south will continue to be disenfranchised by this move. To my next point, the fight against climate change doesn't look like planting trees after the fact. It doesn't look like cleaning up the mess after the fact. It looks like prevention. It looks like restructuring this model that has failed us so utterly that the Earth is on a that we are on a trajectory towards extin extinction. And remember that fossil fuels are a finite resource. The oil will run out. The coal will run out. But let's end it sooner. Let's not wait until they run out. Let's say fossil fuels end now. We, are stop we will no longer mine oil. We will no longer extract coal. Let's end the use of fossil fuels before they end anyway and take us with them. Carbon trading allows us to give ourselves a pat on the back and remain complacent when what we need is a radical restructuring of our systems of production. What we are doing with carbon trading is postponing extinction. We're putting a band-aid on the problem. And that's not what we need. We need to make sure that this earth remains habitable, sustainably, forever. And what carbon trading is doing really will not change the status quo, which is what we need to do at the end of the day. Thank you. So, those who have not caused the problem are the most desperate to solve it. That is the stance from Psi proposition. Let us hear the first speaker from side opposition with a counter argument. Hear, hear. Yeah. Okay, am I audible? So my time begins in three, two, one. First of all, um, we need to we need to look at what carbon trading means. Yeah, they've defined it very well. They've talked about carbon trading being the fact that countries are allowed to produce and sell and uh, yeah. Uh, mostly trade carbon credits, allowing them to actually pollute and reduce carbon emissions as they wish. Um, Something else, um, we need to talk about the, this metric of allowing companies to, pro, uh, to produce carbon emissions or carbon uh, yeah, emissions into the environment. It also, um, we on our side, which is side opposition, we provide reparation mechanisms in the sense that these carbon credits are being created or are being earned by uh, installing reparation mechanisms, which involve planting trees or planting crops that actually reduce these carbon emissions from the environment. We also need to both concede that on both sides of the house, um, carbon emissions or carbon uh, is being emitted um, either way, like there are carbon emissions. We need industries, we need to produce food, we need to produce any other thing that we 
actually need to produce in our industries and manufacturing uh, uh, and manufacturing in our countries. Therefore, carbon is being emitted either way on both our sides. But what we provide for you on side opposition is the fact that we actually provide reparation mechanisms and a cap in the sense that um, companies are not allowed to produce emissions as they wish. These carbon credits produce a sense of capping this amount of emissions that are being produced into the environment. I will do this in two ways, uh, showing you the benefits of these um, of carbon trading and giving you the impact into the society. Um, one of the benefits that carbon credits or carbon trading brings into the society is that companies or countries, because they forgot to actually acknowledge that companies in these countries are the main actors. These industries are actually the main actors. They're the ones that are producing the emissions, not the countries themselves. Therefore, they need to be involved in this particular petition that we're arguing for. So companies or countries in our world have a the carbon credits actually produce a sense in, of, of capping carbon emissions in the, into the atmosphere. So the whole idea of having carbon credits to trade in the first place is so that companies can have a limit as to how many emissions they are, they are trading or they are producing. The whole metric of carbon trading produces restrictions for a company or a country to, um, uh, yeah, to, to exhaust their carbon credits. So, uh, it actually produces a sense of uh, capping the amount of emissions into the into the atmosphere in the sense that if a country or company uh, caps if a country or company exhausts their carbon credits they have to either buy use more money from their revenue or from their taxes or any money that they might have to actually try and buy these credits. So they actually try to um, reduce the amount of carbon emissions that they are producing into the atmosphere so that, so that, so that they do not surpass the carbon credits that they're trying to, that they, that they, that they have. So in a sense, it actually tries to cap the amount of emissions that are being produced by these companies or countries. Another benefit is the reduction in the amount of carbon emissions in the, into the atmosphere. The process of acquiring carbon credits is one that involves the implementation of measures that act as reparation me mechanisms in the sense that in order to acquire these carbon credits, as I said, they need to plant trees, they need to plant um, these particular crops that reduce these emissions. Therefore, we believe that it is better for companies and countries to be allowed to trade uh, carbon credits would be allowed to have these carbon credits um, yeah to be allowed to trade and have them since it will be better for the atmosphere at large um, yes another benefit that it has is um, there's an economic advantage to these companies and countries something that they have completely in ignored in the sense that these companies or countries that sell these carbon emissions like mostly this happens in countries like Africa since we are known as a green continent yeah we have a lot of land we can plant a lot of trees they tried to talk about the fact that how much land is needed to plant trees in order to actually reduce the amount of metric tons of carbons into the in the atmosphere we actually believe you don't really need a large sum of land to plant in enough trees to reduce carbon emissions. A small piece of land or a couple of trees can actually absorb a lot of carbon emissions in the atmosphere. Therefore, we believe that, uh, uh, yeah, we believe, we, we disagree completely with the fact that they try to claim that you need a lot of, a, a large sum of land to actually try and um, plant trees for the reduction of these carbon credits. One, the benefit that I was getting to, economic advantage to the companies, in that companies or countries such as Africa that actually need re these resources gotten from carbon credits will be able to acquire them and actually distribute them or redistribute them to other sectors that actually require this money without actually even touching on their taxes or on their revenue or on anything. They completely try to ignore the economic advantage that it has to these developing countries. Another benefit that it has is it actually creates an incentive for these countries or companies to create reparation mechanisms as I had talked about earlier um, planting trees improves or incre uh, yeah, planting trees uh, increases the amount of carbon credits for a country or for a company or for any other metric that is involved in this carbon credits therefore it actually creates an incentive for countries and companies to try and create reparation mechanisms for carbon that is already in the atmosphere something that they failed to they already ignored something um, yeah, something that you already ignored. This carbon that is already in the atmosphere is actually absorbed and we are able to rejuvenate the environment. And um, yeah, we are able to actually impact on climate change rather than trying to reduce carbon, fossil fuels and all of that as they were trying to claim. Um, I will take them on their worst case scenario, um, which is 
pollution will still continue. It will still even get heightened since they don't produce any type of cap or reparation mechanisms. They try to claim that we will stop uh, the burning of fossil fuels, but they fail to recognize the fact that most of these countries are actually driven economically by these industries and the uh, production of uh, carbon fuels. Therefore, we actually believe that on our side, we actually provide better reparation mechanisms by bettering the, for bettering the environment and we reduce the amount of emissions in the environment. Thank you. Well, halfway through the show, we have two pressing questions presented by both sides of the house. One side says, planting trees is not enough. You can't just plant trees while people are polluting, it beats the purpose. The other side is saying, as long as you create enough incentive for these people to keep planting trees, the world is overall gonna be a better place. Tell me, what do you at home think about this stance? Engage with us at our Twitter handle, at KTN Home. Also, text us, 22151, we always respond. See you after a short break. Welcome back to Campus Debates. So, on this Tuesday night, we are caught at an impasse. Carbon trading, is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Like I said, there is a poll up on our Twitter handle, at KTN Home. Somebody on the poll, or rather one side, is already winning. I won't tell you which one. Check on our Twitter handle to be sure. Or alternatively, stay tuned to see if your side or the side that you voted for wins. Now, with that said, we welcome the second speaker from side proposition. Here, here. I begin my speech in three, two, one. So in my speech, I will be covering what exactly, I will be showing you why we disagree, we disagree with, what, with what OP has come to give us and why we believe that this has more harms than good, right? In my speech, I will show you what is wrong with the case that they have provided and why we think that it is still not justified, that this carbon trade system is still not justified, right? So they come and they say that the carbon is being emitted on both sides, but at least there's a cap on the collective amount of carbon emission. Yes, we agree that this is a benefit of this. We simply think that, however, we think that it is postponing the problem and you do this more on your side than you do on our side. Why? Because the moment you instill this, there is a moral justification and image retention that comes to companies, as my partner has told you, right? You think that there's a regulatory mechanism and so it's okay for you to purchase more, more, more permits, for you to purchase more credits and release more carbon, right? And so at the point at which this happens, you, disinti you disincentivize these companies from finding other sustainable ways to produce. And that is what we find issue with on our side, right? They come and they say, um, at least we get reparations on our side. However, we think that this reparation is marginal as opposed to the harm that it, caused, right? uh, to the harm that it causes, right? So um, we need to consider that the global south is made up of developing countries. What is the backbone of these countries' economies, right? It's agriculture. And you come and you tell me that countries that are contributing so much to this problem should be allowed to contribute more to this problem because we get this marginal benefit and we can plant more trees. We simply do not think that that is true on side proposition, right? Um, they come and say we don't need very much land. However, we do not think that this matters, right? We contribute very marginally to this problem and should not be utilizing our resources to solve this. We need the global north to be able to contribute in the, to, to this problem, right? Because they have the... Let's be honest, if, both, if, bo if we had these big companies and the global north taking part in finding better, more sustainable ways to to do production in a way that is, <laughs> if we had these companies finding sustainable ways to produce, right, we would be at a, we would be at a much further level than if we had the global south and small companies finding ways to do this, right? So um, my, my whole point is that the global north contributes the most to this problem, as, and they have the most resources to be able to solve it, right? However, we, the global south, 
suffer the most for it. And we think that this cap and trade system simply allows them to be able to produce more carbon into the atmosphere because they can simply, buy, they have the economic power. Big companies, right? They have the economic power to be able to just buy and that's a much easier solution for them, right? It's a lot easier than just restru than restructuring the entire production system. And so they might as well buy into this. But for us to have a proper fight against climate change, we need to acknowledge that it is a problem, yes, but we cannot postpone this problem. We cannot allow them to be able to keep producing this carbon as we cannot allow them to keep producing this carbon, this carbon and just buy their way out of it as, as opposed to finding sustainable ways to go about this, right? Um, they come and they say that the... Um, just a second. I'll take the POI. Climate change affects everyone here. People in the global south have the ability to change it. Don't you, don't you think that they should actually try and do it? Climate change does not affect everyone equally. It does not affect everyone to the same extent. As I've told you, the global south relies on agriculture. The effects of climate change are significantly more detrimental to the global south than they are to the global north. And don't I think, the, the second part was, don't I think everyone has the capacity to fix it? I do not think this is necessarily the case because we need to consider that they have the economic power, they have the resources, they have the scientific development to be able to find, to be able to find sustainable ways to meet, to meet the demand that exists within the market as opposed to the global south. And that's why we need these companies to proceed within this, yeah, to be able to, to invest in this, yeah. Um, so what are the comparative harms on their side, yeah? They, on their side, we disincentive we disincentivize these big companies from taking part in this. And then also the people who are affected the most for this have to clean up. This does not hold the people that, that, affect, that cause the problem the most accountable, right? And as I've told you, we, pro we postpone the problem further because then they no longer have an incentive to take part in this right now, right? And the, the only point they will have the incentive to take part of this is, is to, to take part in this is when the resources start running out. And that becomes problematic in the sense that now they join the fight but much later on. And that is why we believe that this system causes more harm than good. Thank you. All right, all right. So guys, before I was a host, I was a debater. And bef no, I was a judge. And before I was a judge, I was a debater. Allow me to flex some knowledge on you here so you know I am not only just a host. When you hear our participants talking about the global north, they're basically talking about North America as a continent. They are talking about Europe. They are talking about Japan and they're talking about South Korea as a large. These are countries that are more forward in terms of investment, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of economics. When they talk about the global south, they are talking about the African continent. They're talking about the Asian continent an exception of the countries that I just stated, and they're talking about the oceanic, count, the oceanic uh, uh, countries. With that said, I think I will welcome the last speaker of the house to deliver his speech. Hear, hear. Yeah, yeah. I'll start my speech now. Climate change affects everyone. Maybe not equally, but indirectly to an equal extent. Because if the global south is the world's producer of food and their entire job is exporting it to the global north, eventually everyone is going to be affected by food shortages. Global temperatures don't rise in specific areas. Marginal rises in the north will affect those people and marginal rises in the equator will still be the same. The burden of the government here is to prove that with all the good we are telling you, there's still more harm. With every single thing that comes that is of profit with carbon credits, then they're still going to be worse no matter what. There's nothing shiny about our extension panel. What we're going to do is we're going to be real in this entire debate. What we tell you first of all, or let's just go with what they tell you. Apparently, this is why there is more harm. First, is that countries will continue polluting. What my speaker tells you is that it doesn't matter. People will still pollute whether or not you have carbon credits. Having them there mitigates this, or mitigates the 
effects of climate change. The other thing is that it does not inspire any changes. What do you inspire or do you think that if there was any other method, then other people wouldn't have had it by now? Because sure, there are a lot of things that we need to acknowledge, that there are a lot of companies that have to exist by polluting. And that's why we have carbon credits, because you cannot always stop polluting. There is an entire chain called the beef industry and all these people who eat meat. And methane is a, one of the key things that is polluting our environment. And you cannot stop eating beef. You cannot make the entire world vegans. To stop or to counter that, people have carbon credits. You cannot stop people producing cars. Maybe even if you, they tell you like their best case scenario is you now have electric cars, electric cars still produce heat. Yes, heat is bad because something that people learn and you'll eventually learn is probably something called the second law of thermodynamics, which is that heat has to leave from a hot place, go to a cold place. That still exists. All those engines that will be produced, every single engine that runs around the world, your elevators moving up, anything that has a motor, any car, any trolley, all of those things are machines. They will all produce heat. They will all contribute to climate change, but there is nothing to solve it on that side. If you think you will change that, there is no way that you get to have that. I'll take you up here in a minute. But yes, what we tell you is it's doing more good than harm because first, it gives people an incentive to change. It motivates companies to not go above the carbon credit they are given. That is the rating, first of all. If it's too much, whatever they are doing, then they have to find innovative ways to change it. That is just fast. Because if you cannot afford the carbon credits or the level of pollution that you are having, you have to change it. If you cannot, then stop it or find alternative ways. That is the only incentive that you get. But in the other case where not only do we cater for those people, by the way, the people who pollute, but also the people who they apparently are trying to run for, which is the people in the global south. These people now have an incentive to produce carbon credits. Yes, people produce carbon credits by planting trees, by creating forms of energy with renewable sources of energy, whatever Kenjen is doing, being one of the biggest uh, producers of geothermal power in the world. Those people get to have more carbon credits and get to sell it. The thing that is motivating them to do that could be the cash that they get to get from that. That is a very huge stream of revenue that you cannot say it does not exist just because apparently there's supposed to be more harm. Now, another thing is the fact that we are actually giving companies more choice. Yes, everyone deserves to have a choice no matter whatever we consider ourselves as a civilization. The fact that people can now have a choice of opting in or out of the carbon credits is a really good thing on our side. No matter what they try to paint is that, apparently people should not have this choice because it is bad. How about first of all, they get to choose that. People, if it is bad, they will decide that for themselves. Giving them less choice is still harmful no matter what because you're now leading people to a path with a very narrow or naive sense of choice. And that is what we are against. People need to be able and companies need to be able to have the opportunity to choose so that when you get to choose wrong it is because you did not know and there's always backlash because people spill oils in the sea and people cancel them you do anything that pollutes the environment people cancel you there's a lot of talks on twitter just like we are having in this conversation and on that platform a lot of things will always come up so public backlash is something that companies don't want so yes we can entrust them with that responsibility another thing is the pricing and people who are affected yes these people get to now have avenues to make money if you're generating carbon credits Everyone gets to have their own stream of revenue. If that is the job people get to do in the global south, go for it. Because that is what they did in the global north. They decided to industrialize. We did not have the resources to do that. But now we have the resources to go into carbon trading, to go into carbon market creation or carbon credit creation. Wonderful thing for everyone. We say give it to them. They say it's very wrong. I'll take you up your way. So you mentioned that there are industries that can only exist by polluting, and you cited the example of the beef industry. A fun fact is the reason the beef industry produces so much methane is because they use a model called factory farming. And this is a model that under your model of carbon trading, they would be allowed to keep as long the beef as industry you does buy not a use coal farming. It no, pollutes because of the farming. methane production, first of all, but then there are transportation costs that will still exist whether or not you have oil being increased. Actually, who uses coal in Kenya right now to use anything or to grow there or to use to feed their livestock? It's very hard for you to prove that. So what you're trying to prove that there is more harm does not exist. Another thing is we tell you that there is more regulation of these emissions. Yes, people now can be regulated to the extent that you can pollute. Because you don't have carbon credits, Apple can pollute as much as it wants. Saudi Aramco can pollute as much as it wants because these people have no lines or there's no litigation to whatever they can do. Carbon credits gives you that. You have a metric to where you can pollute to. If 
If you don't have that, then you're not even having more harm than good. We did not even have to prove that, but we've exceeded our burden. We don't know what proposition was trying to do here, but yes, we are not also postponing the problem. We are mitigating, which is a very effective method of tackling climate change. We are very, very proud to oppose here, here. That brings us to the end of the debating portion of today's episode. And the stance between the two sides is creation of economic perspective in form of revenue and creation of an incentive to change vis-a-vis -vis protecting the very vulnerable interests of the very vulnerable global south by forcing them to deal with a problem that they did not create at first instance but somehow seems to bear the biggest burden. 22151 is our SMS handle. Text us and catch us on Twitter at KTN Home. Let us know what you think before we come back with the judges' deliberation. Hear, hear. Welcome back to Campus Debates for the last part of today's episode, which is the judges' deliberation, their feedback, and getting to know who takes the cup home for this specific round. Taking it straight to the panel, they will ask one general question that will be answered by both sides of the house. Then each of the panelists will ask one specific question aimed, to at, aimed at an attempt to sway not only the judges, but you who is watching us at home. Stay tuned to see what the panel decides. Okay, so my question goes to proposition. Your entire case is based on negating this entire carbon trading method because you say it's actually not addressing the root. So you deciding to say that it's actually a harm than a good, what would you think would be the best approach for Kenya to take? Would it be to actually withdraw from using carbon trading and what would be the future of the Kenyan companies? So um, as said, proposition, we do think that Kenya should withdraw. And we think that a reasonable alternative would be to have a rigid cap on how much companies can on how much companies can emit. Like a cap they necessarily can't go past. So that if they want to emit any more or to use any more carbon, they would have to find other sustainable ways of doing this and meeting that demand. Yeah. My question goes to side opposition. How effective do you think it is to plant trees and find renewable sources of energy in the fight against all the companies that are basically producing carbon in the global north? Yeah, how effective do you think it can be? So, um, from side opposition, we believe that it will be more effective for all the companies in uh, probably a third world country like this one, our country, Kenya, as um, to uh, work together in providing reparation mechanisms, that is planting the trees and planting all those vegetation and taking uh, the measures to try and uh, rejuvenate the environment. We believe it is more effective if they work together to try and provide all these reparation mechanisms um, rather than, um, yeah, we believe actually it is more effective for them to try and work together to plant trees and go in into going green to try and provide these separation mechanisms to the environment rather than what side opposition proposition was trying to say whereby we should cap uh, industries and stop producing emissions since these industries that produce emissions are the ones that are feeding us as a country and they are the ones that are catering for our processing and manufacturing industries. Therefore, everything that we use as a country in terms of food and uh, clothing and everything comes from emitting. Therefore, all the companies should take part in providing reparation mechanisms. Thank you. Uh, my question goes to both sides of the team. Uh, so what incentive does, that, uh, does Africa then have to keep intact with the Nairobi Declaration that was given in the African Summit 2023? Um, what incentive does Africa then have to keep touch with the Nairobi Declaration that was given, uh, that was 
given out this year. The incentive African countries have to keep in touch with the Nairobi Declaration when it comes to carbon credits and carbon trading is the benefits they get. Considering 2021, the biggest sale or the biggest carbon trade in the world was done in was Saudi Arabia buying carbon credits from Kenya, and that is the biggest that has been done in the world, then basically African countries get to be more motivated financially if that is the worst thing that could be there. Thank you. Okay. Um, I actually agree with the other side. Africa would have a financial incentive to take part in the carbon trading, um, but we need to recognize that we can't have, of course we're getting paid for carbon offsetting, however, what is the end goal? Will we cover Africa in trees, and then South America, and then Australia? We simply do not have enough re land, simply, to keep up with the amount of carbon that's being produced by these companies. And with a carbon offsetting system like this, I think our main motivator should be survival, should be our future, rather than money. So that wraps up the clarification segment of this part of the episode. The panelists have asked your questions, the speakers have answered. Do you think that their answers have in any way swayed the panel? Have the answers in any way, shape or form swayed you, the audience, both in house and at home? With that said, I think it is time for us to bring this home. Chair, are you ready? Drum roll, please. Um, thank you, so the winner for this uh, particular round is Team Gov Proposition. Team Proposition for the win. Um, and this is, uh, this was broken down to the simple fact that we are trying to look at it as the carbon trading being a fact, uh, a fight for the greater, it being a, either a good fight or a bad fight, for lack of better words, um, against climate change. And what government or proposition side kind, um, brings on board is the fact that the fight that you're fighting for isn't even ours to begin with. These guys already, and this is uh, in brought by both sides of the house, saying that the global north have the power, have the wealth to be able to have the resources to fight us. So if they already have the resources, again, Gav shows you that, then why is it that we're trying to bring someone else who isn't even uh, part of this fight to fight this fight? Then that means brings their point of uh, procrastination and avoidance of the problem. So if we're really trying to fight climate change, then why have a solution that is just going to prolong the same thing that's been happening over and over again? And we better get that from side uh, proposition. Thank you. Yes. Ladies, stand up, take a bow. We thank God you're alive because now you won. <laughs> anyway, that was us here from KTN Home. Remember, the conversation doesn't have to stop here. Keep engaging us on our Twitter handle at KTN Home or text us 22151. As always, we will never leave you on red. See you next time, same time, same place. Bye-bye.